Hi, this is Doug from Dynamic Computing, and welcome to episode 51 of 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast, the Amiga 2000 Adventures, part two. Now, a few months ago, I picked up a really nice Amiga 2000 from a gentleman named Curtis for a really good price, and I did an Amiga Adventures video on that. Since then, I've upgraded this old girl pretty nicely with a nice GVP 040 combo card. Originally had 16 megs of RAM, now I've brought it up to 64 uh, megabytes of RAM, put in a SCSI to SD interface card from uh, Alex Perez at Inertial Computing, and I wanted to do an update video on what I've done since then and talk a little bit more in depth about the actual Amiga 2000. Let's take a look. Now here we have a bare naked Amiga 2000 boards. This is one of my marginally working boards, not the one in my actual machine. Now the Amiga 2000 was released in March of 1987 and continued to sell into 1991. It was the big brother to the cost reduced Amiga 500 and both of those machines replaced the lovely but not too expandable Amiga 1000. She was the first Amiga with expansion slots called Zorro 2 slots. The original expansion bus on the A1000 and A500 are called Zorro slots. There are five, one, two, three, four, five, 16-bit Zorro 2 interfaces for things like graphics cards, SCSI controller, serial and parallel port, fast RAM up to eight megabytes and more. Now, dozens and dozens of cards were made for the Zorro 2 bus during the life of the Amiga, and cards are still being made for it today. It came with one megabyte of RAM. The original Amiga 2000 had 512K of chip memory and 512K of fast memory, but later units came with one megabyte chip standard because they shipped with the one megabyte Agnes chip like this little beauty right here. And while these Zorro 2 slots are not considered magnificent uh, in performance today, they can handle about 3.5, maybe a little bit more megabytes per second of data transfer. For the time, they were superior in some ways to the 16-bit ISA slots and PCs because the Amiga supported auto-config, which did a great job of automatically locating and configuring hardware devices on the Zorro 2 bus making it easier to add devices than the PCs of the era. The PCs really did not start auto-configuring hardware until the advent of the not-so-popular eISA or MCA slots or the PCI slots of the mid-90s. We were so much more advanced than those sad, sad PCs. Speaking of ISA slots, the A2000 has two 16-bit ISA slots in line with two Zorro 2 slots and two 8-bit slots. These are designed to be activated by installing an XT, AT, or 386SX bridge board, like this one. Da 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 da! Please don't give me a hit, Nintendo. So this is a 386SX bridge board, and it would slot up, if you can see here, with the Zorro 2 slots and the 16-bit slot right in here, and give your PC full 386 compatibility in my case. Then you can add additional cards to these 16-bit ISA slot or these two 8-bit slots like video cards, hard drive controllers, things like that to really give it full PC compatibility. Here we have a CPU expansion slot. Now this is designed for things like uh, 020, 030, 040, or even 060 uh, accelerator cards. It also gives you the advantage when you use this slot and use the right kind of card to go far beyond the 8 megabytes of RAM that the 68000 in the Amiga supports. Theoretically, it supports 16 megs of RAM, but that it uses that RAM space for other purposes. So you can go up to 64 megabytes, 128 megabytes, even higher if you really want to, using an expansion card in this slot. Now, I have a very nice 68040 running at 33 megahertz with a fairly fast SCSI controller and 64 megabytes of memory. 
Even with such a fast CPU, the Amiga 2000 is slowed a bit by the 16-bit chip RAM bus and general 16 or 24-bit data pathways of the Amiga 2000. So you will notice an Amiga 4000 or an Amiga 3000 at the same fast clock speed performing better than an Amiga 2000. Lastly, way back here behind Paula and Denise, she has a video expansion slot. Now this slot was popular for things like Genlocks, Flickr Fixers, and the ubiquitous Video Toaster, like the one I will show you right here. There's our beautiful little Video Toaster, and you can see it's a really, really tight fit into that video slot, and it goes right up to the edge of where the case would be, so you do have to worry about shorting and having this hit the actual case. Now the video slot passes through all the Amiga video signals. That's why it's able to work so nicely with flicker fixers and genlocks and things like that. Now the beauty of the Amiga 2000 is its incredible expansion potential. With all its Zorro 2 slots down in here, you can create almost any kind of machine you can imagine. For example, something I use on a regular basis is this Picasso 2 graphics card. While this one is not as fast and powerful as something like the CyberGraphics 64 3D in my Amiga 4000, it works pretty well on an Amiga 2000, allowing the machine to work in resolutions from 640x480, 800x600, and 1024x768 in up to millions of colors. The fantastic Picasso 96 software, owned by individual computers, lets you use Workbench and most well-written software in these high-resolution modes. Over here, I've got a personal animation recorder installed. One of these, half of this card, fits into a Zorro 2 slot. The other is an actual time-based corrector that's used to capture the images for the personal animation recorder. And it's installed in one of the 8-bit ISA slots just for power. Now, I don't use the personal animation recorder in this video. I'm only using the time-based corrector for my video toaster demonstration I'll do in just a minute. Over here in the CPU slot, you see I've got my nice GVP 68040 card. Over here in the far right, you can see my toasters in there. Then I've got a floppy drive, a nice SD to SCSI interface from inertial computing. And I've also got a nice SCSI CD-ROM that I occasionally use mounted in here. I could take that out, put another device in there if I wanted to, but so now that we've spent a few minutes talking about the Amiga 2000's hardware and some of the expansion cards I have in there, let's see what the Amiga 2000 can actually do. We're going to start out by looking at the ECS graphics of this little guy. Now we're going to start out just capturing images directly from the monitor instead of doing what I'd normally do and capture them from my capture card so you can really see what's going on here. This is a normal 640 by probably about 460 or so ECS image, 16 color workbench, okay? You can see it looks absolutely beautiful. There's my 16 color version of the logo in the background here. When we open something up, you can see, you know, it looks beautiful. It takes a few seconds to move things around the screen, but it's pretty snappy on a 68040, and it looks, you know, fine, perfectly usable. Now, let's jump into one of the Picasso modes. Now this is unique, the Picasso 2 card is unique because it will pass through the 15 kilohertz Amiga signal, pass it through the Picasso card and allow it to display on a monitor. And I'm lucky enough to have this Dell monitor that will scan at 15 kilohertz or 31 kilohertz. I can display both regular ECS modes or I can display its enhanced modes. Let's take a look. We're gonna go into screen modes here. Now here's another important point. Notice how when I've got it at 16 colors and I've got a 640 by a 480 screen chosen and I've got a big relatively high color image in the background, I'm using almost a megabyte of chip memory from the two megs that I have on this particular machine. We're gonna jump into Picasso 800 by 600, 16 bit color mode. So 65,000 colors. So the image pops back up here. Now it's gonna be in 65,000 color mode. And let's take a look at what happens with my background image. There, looks a little better, huh? Everything about it looks better and sharper. Look what happens to my chip memory when I use a retargetable graphics card. 
it frees up all that memory, almost 800 kilobytes of memory that was being used before by things like this relatively high color 800 by 600 background image. All of that is now free for the Amiga. And look how much snappier and zippier everything is. When I move windows around, it's much faster than it was uh, in the Amiga 640 by 480 in 16 color mode. When I open up Windows, you see everything snaps to life much, much, much faster. Now let's see how retargetable graphics can be used with well-behaved Amiga programs. Now a program like ProWrite is normally going to open up in a 640x200 or a 640x400 interlaced screen. When you have retargetable graphics and a program like New Mode, which I've talked about before and it comes with a, a Best Workbench 1.1, I think it ships with it, it gives you a choice of which graphics mode to launch in. So we're going to tell this we want ProWrite in 800 by 600, 256 color mode. Click on Use. And ProWrite now opens up just beautifully in a nice high resolution mode where you can see a lot more on the screen than you can with a regular program. See, here we've got a full document. This is uh, from episode 35, my personal paint review. And you can see how much text displays right on the screen much better than a traditional Amiga screen, much clearer, much sharper. As long as it's a well-behaved workbench program, no problem at all with retargetable graphics. Other programs will support retargetable graphics natively, like Personal Paint, which I just had my uh, script open there, which Pixel Vixen and I reviewed a couple of months back, natively supports retargetable graphics. So. In this case, we're gonna change the image format. We're gonna say, oh, we want an 800 by 600, eight bit, which is a 256 color image. We wanna use that screen. Again, this is just an Amiga 2000 with ECS graphics. And now we've got 256 colors and it will open up AGA images like a dream. Let's find one here. So this will be a 256 color, 800 by 600 AGA image. We're gonna go ahead and open up the AGA image in here. And you can see it imports all 256 colors and we've got a very beautiful AGA picture right on our Amiga 2000. Now, bear in mind, this does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that AGA games will play, but it will open AGA images and graphics and even playback AGA videos if you want it to. Another program I use all the time with my graphics card is Art Department Professional. I just love this program. It can import JPEG images and things like that. Now this image that I'm just importing is one of Pixel Vixens that she did for uh, uh, a show several episodes back. It's a picture of the Louvre in France. Now you'll notice down here it says it's a 1280 by 946 image. While it's possible to downscale this and display in standard ham 6 mode, let's tell it to display in a nice Picasso mode. So we go over here to our savers option. We go to Picasso 2. It says, okay, how do we want to display that? Let's do 1024 by 768 in 16-bit color. Let's see if it can handle that. Now it has scaled the image a little bit because we're not at the same resolution, but I think you'll agree that looks pretty darn good. We can also scale the image down. So if we wanted to say make this a 640 by 480 image, and use it as a desktop background. Okay, we're gonna scale it down to 640 by 480. And then we're gonna take a look at what it looks like at 640 by 480, and we'll go with a full 24-bit color. Tell it to generate Picasso 96, 640 by 480, 24-bit color. <laughs> Not too shabby, huh? Not too shabby at all. So we've got this fancy retargetable graphics card in here, but what if we just want to play a simple Amiga game? 
Well, the beauty of retargetable graphics on the Amiga is, is it does not interfere with the standard RGB video that's coming out. Now, I'm lucky in my case because my Picasso card has a pass-through, so I can display it on this monitor. Uh, your mileage may vary with your retargetable graphics card, and you may have to hook up a separate, like a 1084S monitor, to your 23-pin RGB connector, but it'll send the signal through just fine. Let's take a look. We'll try a game of Blasteroids here. Now it's going to change the resolution on us down to the standard Blasteroids resolution. Now my monitor is finicky in that every time it changes resolutions to a 15 kilohertz resolution, I have to fiddle with those settings there for a second. But once they're fiddled with, it comes up absolutely beautifully. Now, speaking of monitors, you may notice that I have a wall of monitors behind me. These all work along with the video toaster. This is not like our modern video that we do where we record onto an SD card and then we just bring it into the computer and boom, everything's clean. With a video toaster, it requires several inputs and outputs in order to get everything put together. Let me show you a little bit about the toaster. Now the video toaster will work just fine with one video camera and one output source, like a recording device, whether it's a VCR or whether it's a digital device like I'm using to record to. The minute you try to introduce a second video device, like another camera or another VCR, you need what's called a time-based corrector. Now I'm not going to go over all the details in this video, but I will be doing video toaster tutorials in the near future where I'll cover all of those things. But for now, just know that I'm using the time-based corrector that's built into my personal animation recorder on my Amiga 2000 so I can sync up my two cameras. Now here's something really cool about the video toaster. It is totally free and available online to download the software for the toaster. You can get version three, you can get version 4.3, and it has most of the software and utilities with it, uh, totally free. So if you've got a toaster, you can upgrade to the latest version for free. And there is a version that works without the actual physical toaster hardware that lets you play with some of the things that the toaster can do. I haven't tried it, but I've seen it online. I'll put a link in the description. First thing first, let's launch the toaster software. Okay, so we've got the toaster software launched. And you'll notice on this screen behind me here, my main screen is in black and white. And that's because your, your primary monitor that you're using to fiddle with things and change things generally comes out the composite connection of your Amiga 2000. In this case, it's just going to come in in black and white. Now up here, I have a nice 1702 monitor that's displaying one of the outputs of my Amiga 2000. It's called the preview output. And this one is going to be the actual output to my recording device. From the toaster screen, I can tell it, okay, I want this first output to be video from my main camera. So you'll see now this monitor is the output from my main camera that I use to record. The second monitor, I want to say, boom, I want this to be recording from my secondary camera that I have up here. It's getting confusing pointing to all these different cameras. <laughs> As a matter of fact, let's change the view of camera number two. So now camera number two, if you look up here, is going to be an image of my beautiful Amiga 1000 and my beautiful Checkmate case with my Amiga 500 in it. So you see here we have our two live images, one of the Amiga, one of the, the monitor, so you can see what's happening. And with the Toaster 2000, you can easily create these awesome little effects to transition between your two live videos. Say, for example, you've got a live video up here of this handsome devil right here. Smile, Doug. And you want to transition to the Amigas. And it transitions right to the Amigas. All right. And we'll transition back with a different transition. So as you're recording this on the recording device, it will actually do those live video transitions. And you can see while it's doing the transition and I'm moving my big old 
bulky head here that it's actually doing those transitions live. Now this was unheard of back in the day for doing it on live video. Here's a few more cool ones. Here's the lovely and talented Kiki Stockhammer. I think everybody should know who she is. Here's some nice page peels. Some really cool digital effects. I love this one. And again, all the video still continues to be live while it's doing these transition. Some of these effects, listen to that, have sound effects built into them. And then there's also some of these cool effects. Let me switch my cameras back here. There we go. This is a snowfall effect. So, while I'm recording the video, you can see the snow falling. Isn't that cool? And that actually would be recorded on the live video too. Now there's so much more to the toaster that I'm going to be going really, really in depth with for your viewing pleasure in the next couple of weeks on how to use it and just what it can do. But some of the few things we'll touch on, it's a full 24 bit frame buffer. So you can actually capture images. So I could capture this beautiful mug right here, capture it to a 24 bit image, bring it over to the Amiga side of things. It has a full 24 bit painting program built right into it. It has a great character generator, which I will show you in just one second. And of course it comes with Lightwave 3D, which is a fantastic 3D rendering product that's done some of the most beautiful rendering images that you've seen. Uh, Babylon 5, a couple other shows like that have done it. Sequest DSV used uh, the toaster extensively, lots of music videos, and even today it can make some incredible images. And that's all included when you get the toaster. Now the Video Toaster 2000 makes a pretty impressive video studio to even today. Now, it is only going to be 480i, or in the case I'm running it through my retro trink, Retro tink, it should be 480p when I record, but it still does a really incredible job. So, is the Amiga 2000 the perfect Amiga to get for your Amiga retro hobby? Well, yes and no. It is really big, it is really heavy, and it is really bulky. It takes up a lot of space, and I will not deny that. If you're just going to be doing some gaming, get yourself an Amiga 500, 600, or 1200, and max that little guy out and you'll be just fine. You don't need the bulk of an Amiga 2000. But if you want to expand your Amiga until the cows come home, by all means, find yourself an Amiga 2000 because they are so expandable. You can just keep putting stuff in it until the power supply blows up. Is it superior to getting an Amiga 3000 or an Amiga 4000? Eh, in, for some reasons, yes. The Amiga 3000 and 4000 have absolutely faster access to the chips, absolutely faster access to chip RAM, and you're going to get a faster experience no matter how what you're talking about. But if you're the kind of person that likes to tinker and pop things in and out of the Amiga like I do and play with this and play with that, it's a lot easier to do on an Amiga 2000. On the 3000 and 4000, you have this little riser card that the Zorro 3 slots fit into that you're constantly fighting with to get them in and get them tight and worried that you're gonna break the whole Amiga while you're doing it. With an Amiga 2000, it's like, ka-chunk. Here, let me just get a hammer and bang it in. It's fine. And Zorro 2 cards are still available today. You can still pick some up from places like Eryx Labs, they have some memory cards and some hard drive controllers. Places like individual computers still sell some memory cards and hard drive controllers that work fine in your Zorro 2 Amiga. And there's lots of them available online on places like eBay and Amy Bay and such. Now, how hard is it to find an Amiga 2000 and how much does it cost? I think it's probably a little easier to find them in North America. I think they were more popular in North America, the, the big box Amigas. Uh, a lot of the Europeans would go with the 500s and 600s and 1200s, and that's great. Over here, I've been able to find two of them so far in the past year, 150 bucks, 200 bucks. You know, it, it's pretty reasonably priced. Shipping is a killer, okay? 150 bucks for the Amiga. 90 bucks to ship it because it weighs a ton and it's just huge. So be aware of that. And if you can pick it up locally, even better. 
I've seen some Amiga 2000s that have an, maybe an accelerator or maybe have a hard drive controller and some memory built into it that sell for $300, $400. That's still a reasonable deal if the Amiga works. Get that Varda battery out if it's not already out though. I really enjoy my Amiga 2000 even though it does take up a lot of room. It's great to experiment with. It's it, The quality is incredible. I mean it can do since I'm not a huge gamer, it can do just about everything I need to do with high color, uh, high quality images, which I normally deal with. And it feels less fragile than constantly experimenting on my Amiga 3000 or Amiga 4000 popping cards in and out. So I love mine. Now, as you may have heard uh, last episode, I now have a Patreon account. And if any of you would like to come and help me out and help me produce better quality videos in the future by becoming a patron. I'll put the link right down here. But what better way to celebrate my current patrons than by displaying their names on the Video Toaster 2000. This is all done on the Video Toaster. Enjoy! So, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. There'll be a lot more with the Amiga 2000 coming in the next couple of weeks. A lot of video toaster stuff. Please like, please subscribe, and for heaven's sakes, comment. Tell me about your Amiga 2000. Tell me about your equipment. I'd love to hear about it. And every little bit like that helps the channel. Follow me on Twitter at 10mark1. But until next time, this is Doug from 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Signing out.